Hello, and welcome back to the Dr. Indifficult Show. Today I have Pyromaniac on. Uh, hey, how's it going, guys? So, you know, how did you initially find 2B2T in the first place? I know, I know it was a very long time ago. You were one of the oldest people to play on the server. Um, yeah, so it was back in 2010, uh, December, and I was working in a phone shop in, like, a tiny town in Ireland, and it was like dead because of the recession. So we might've had four or five customers a day. And, um, all I had was basically a laptop. Um, so I started, you know, browsing boards and chans and different things. And on V, um, I saw people advertising 2B2T. Um, so I'd always followed Minecraft, um, basically since it started. Um, and I had always looked into SMP since it launched in that August, but all the other servers were, you know, admins giving things to their friends or weird plugins. Like, you know, people like the servers with the plugins, but the 2B2T vanilla experience at the time um, was pretty much the closest thing to what you could, what you could get out of the box and no moderation and no admins kind of flying around, you know? Yeah, and what what was it like in the very beginning? You know, this was this was around like what 2011, 2000? Uh, 2010. So really? the server was on beta. the server was in alpha one point seven, which there are a couple of differences you have to consider with that is that you didn't have hunger, there were no enchantments, um, lots of you know game mechanics you take for granted weren't present. Um, the map in the first couple of days, I'm I'm pretty sure I joined almost right at the start because I was on the boards where it was being advertised. You know when it was being put up and that was only within the first couple of days. I think the server owners were doing that house master and whoever else he was with. Um, so in the first couple of days, most of the damage done to spawn was from creepers. Um, there were a lot of mobs around at that point in time and lots of nakeds cause advertising on a Chan board, you just get loads and loads of people visiting, especially V at that time, which is, you know, the center of the Minecraft community, along with a couple of small forums, but basically, you know, the game was very popular on that board. And as for the server, you just get 50, 60 people joining at a time. Um, so pretty much wrecked straight away, uh, lava casts, um, creeper holes everywhere. Uh, the actual spawn radius itself was only about 50 blocks wide. So everybody who was spawning in, I don't know, 50, hundred, I don't know precisely, but it was small. So everybody was respawning in the same area. So that, area was very busy um lots of people chasing each other punching each other pretty much exactly the same as you'd expect on any anarchy server and any server you bring up now yeah and uh you know you're kind of known as the the oldest fag you know it's kind of a an interesting title to title to have <laughs> on this on this server um yeah so i, I mean i guess if you want to talk about staying on a server for 10 years and sort of coming and going and dipping in and out. I think one of the reasons why I lasted as long as I did is because I never really got in as deep as other people, for example, or got caught up in a lot of community drama or, you know, I kind of went out and played myself. I had occasional visits to other people. I had people I chatted to in the chat. Um, but for the most part, I've kept a fairly low profile until pretty recently. Um, just kind of out of experiencing the server more passively. Um, in the early days, I suppose, as later on, there were really two camps of players on 2B2T. There were the people who were there mainly for the vanilla experience, and there were the people who were there because of the no moderation thing and the, you know, the griefing and hacking and all that stuff. And, you know, the dynamic between those two groups has shifted and morphed over the years, but for the most part, players kind of fall into, well, at that time, fell into either of those two camps. Um, and, you know, later on, you get people who are more into community building and other people who want to hunt at spawn and these different kind of approaches to the gameplay. But, like, there would have been, not to say factions, but sort of groups of people in the chat who'd be kind of, you know, this is the vanilla experience and other people who'd be, you know, there to troll or there to grieve. Or yeah, to yeah. Shit post or whatever. And the standard stuff people do on these kinds of unmoderated um, servers. And, and that's, think, like, that, that, that is the crazy thing, how, how it has changed from being, you know, sort of a, you know, you want to just build and play Minecraft regu regularly or grief to you want to PVP or build a base, you know, it's just kind of become a lot more standard. Yeah. And I mean, there are lessons, I suppose, to speak as an old fact, we never really got that deep into the Minecraft gameplay mechanics and the sort of community aspect is that 
what they taught us later on was that you could actually have a group base. You could actually trust people. Once you, but once you build a kind of community scaffolding around it in the discord groups and in the steam groups and things, you actually start to get players trusting each other more and, you know, accepting that their base might get griefed, accepting that these things start, these things happen. And, and I suppose I based alone on and off. Um, I, I built a base with a couple of people now and then, and I wrote a blog for James Russell's kind of talking about that, but, um, mostly alone most of the time during those years. And then you just chat to people in the chat and you do your build and you play and whatever, you know? Yeah. And what was that like experiencing that growth of people, you know, deciding to group up, you know, going from a bunch of solo players to big groups, big bases. What was, what was so, that transformation like? So you'd early on, you'd have the face punchers who were one group that had been fairly coherent. And there are different groups of players that have come from that. And a lot of history has been kind of recounted about that. And then, you know, people went their separate ways and things became more atomized and the population of the server wasn't really enough to sustain five or six people basis. Cause there might only be 10, 20, even 30 people on at a time would be busy. Um, and then in around 2013, you get the group that everyone's familiar with the, the Valkyrian group, the Asgard group, the, you know, fit MC and Sado and all these personalities start to come on the scene as a, I suppose the server has already gained a reputation at that point. And these guys come in, with new ideas and they start really driving things to another level. And they, you know, you, everybody's aware of this at this point, that 2013 saw this kind of resurgence of that community in particular and others around it. And then 2016 came along and there was already certain established power groups on the server and things have been stagnant for a while. People have been in fighting and there was drama about the Trist and thing at the back door and all this other stuff again, that people are aware of. Um, and that group kind of took charge obviously as they would have of the, of the influx and they shaped what those people thought about the server, how they conceived it and how they interacted with it. And they imparted an attitude that was, at first kind of, you know, combative, it was the war thing. And then they, they would sort of feature different things people had achieved on the server. And it became much more about what you achieved on the server rather than just kind of passively playing Minecraft on it. You know, I, I guess, I hope I've been clear on there. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was really concise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> be, better than I, better than I could have put it. But, um, so you were saying, you know, some of these groups have, have risen up, you know, Asgard, you know, Sato, all that stuff. Uh, and with that comes incursions. And you've been around for all of them, obviously, since you've been here since 2010. So yeah. what was it like experiencing each one and how, you know, which one was maybe your favorite? You know, how are they different? Like, what, what was it? What were those experiences like during that time? Well, I mean, I suppose finding out something like that is going on is just logging onto the server usually like rather than the, after the, the the advent of discords and things you just log onto the server and realize there was something big going on that people were well new fags were chatting in a panic and people were excited about it it's like a the spawn thing is like a coliseum and it's become <laughs> spawn on 2b2t has practically become its own meta anybody that's visited nether zero zero knows that that there's this whole Darwinian evolution of meta that's gone on. And, you know, you look back on the incursions and you see the development of people's strategies and just the insane things people are doing, like building the water cube or, or covering the thing with obsidian or do, do the various projects that have gone on at spawn. And as incursions go, there are always other little projects going on because there's groups of people that have met up at spawn people that you normally interact in the chat and they're all in person for once. There are other projects that happen near that. Um, like around the time, I think it was the third incursion or something, Jared, uh, Jared called one or maybe he participated in it. And he built this Jared town structure at 666, 666. It's sort of encased in a lava cast now, but a, a couple of people are aware of where it is. And, you know, he must have had 15 or 20 people just working on this thing, defending it, blowing it up. It was a build that was constantly getting put full of holes and then thrown up again. And there were so many people building and so many people destroying and the thing sort of for about two or three days was under constant flux. Um, and that's the kind of thing, I suppose that kind of sums up what the incursions are like. It's like this huge flux, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, so like a, like a server holiday in a way. You know, everybody just comes together for it. 
Yeah. Um, but it, like as Spawn goes, a couple of the things that are somewhat interesting, um, the different remains of things that you become aware of as you kind of tour around Spawn and watching those appear over the years has been interesting, seeing the different layers of builds that people have put on top of each other and knowing roughly when things started to appear. Even lava casts, some of them are interesting. You go inside them and they're sort of wrecks and relics of bases and chests and things people have left. Like Spawn is an entirely man-made environment now. Yeah, not, not, to get, not to get too LARPy with what I'm about to say, but like it is kind of interesting how builds, you know, they get destroyed, but there's still remnants there. Like you can still tell where something was or you can still kind of see... Yeah, you know. um, there was all, almost entirely intact undersea base that myself, Passy, and one other guy built in like 2011 spring, pretty early on. We excavated this sort of big square cabin and we built a mob grinder in there and we built cab quarters and it was, you know, we weren't far out from Swan. I think it was maybe two or three K. That's still there and it's still mostly intact. It's, it's it, it, you know, it's been blown up here and there and I think there's a lava cast inside it, but it's a 2011 base that's still roughly there. Um, and it's there to visit. Since 2015, I've kept a sort of glass and lava structure. That's one. I keep going back and rebuilding it and checking in on it to see it blown up and seeing the different ways people have blown it up. And, you know, it's easy to throw up over 20 minutes. Yeah, and I, th I think people get, you know, really caught up with the idea of going really far out to make a base when there's no excitement in that, you know? There's, there's a lot more excitement in building something closer to spawn that, you know, stuff happens. Yeah, well... Like the little lava thing, you can always see it on every one of the renders. I've, you know, you see the renders get posted and you can see this little triangle of lava usually there because I've usually repaired it. And, you know, I hop back and forth and, and do different group builds and things. And, um, but yeah, that, that shrine has been there since 2015 and it, a couple of people know about it and it'll be blown up again next week and someone else will rebuild it, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, this is a good kind of lead into my, to my next question I have for you. Uh, you know, what were some of your first experiences on the server? Some of the, maybe the first people that you met and some of the first things that you did and maybe important um, things in general too. Yeah. So as I said, there was that cavern, but well, the first, one of the first things I did was set up a, a like a sanctuary. I think it was about three K. Um, it was like a cobble house with some farms and I come on every day or two and reseed them for people. And, um, I got blown up after about two weeks, which was pretty good for how close it was. Um, and that was, that was like a week or two in. Um, after that, there was, it was like spring 2011. There was that undersea cavern base thing with the grinder and everything with Passio 5. Um, I think Branalon possibly was there. There, there would have been a couple of other people there. Um, and we were under basically a lake at spawn for about three months, I'd say. You know, we had trees growing in there and all kinds of stuff like that. It might have been one of the first spawn sanctuaries, but don't quote me on that. I could be wrong. Um, or spawn bases. Uh, that is actually connected to the Penny Dropper, which is another base that's at spawn and somewhat intact. Um, after that, I headed out to maybe 60K. Um, like there weren't really nether highways to the same extent, and there weren't really, um, you know, canals or any of that stuff. So traveling over the world was fairly easy before hunger and um, people hacked the nether roof as well. Um, you could walk on the nether roof and put portals up there and use that to travel around. Um, it was patched, but like much, much later. Um, there was the thunder hack. Yeah. I was at a base for that and I think it may have gotten griefed for that or something else. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, that'd take us, I suppose, about a year and a half in, um, just kind of basing initially around spawn, moving further and further out, getting to know people shit posting in the chat going to the tiny chat rooms like there wasn't as much going on to be honest yeah it was more of a more of a tight-knit community back before uh you know pre-june well yeah like there was the face punch thing that brought a lot of players in in the spring and like i suppose the player numbers for 2011 were fairly high um 2012 again some stagnation and then 2013 like a renewal with the with those guys I mentioned before. Yeah, and um, what were some people that you encountered on this experience? I know you, met, you mentioned Passy. Uh, yeah. Um, who were a few X, people that you've met along your way? There are loads of them. I mean, um, X0 XP, I suppose. Um, just I'm trying to think of people you shitpost in the chat with. And Pyrobite, obviously. 
um, there was always a, the running joke between our two names. And yeah, you must get confused really with him cool, a lot. He's a really cool guy if you can get an interview with him. Um, like he has a lot to say and he's a... I would he's love that. Guy. Yeah, no, I don't know how to get in touch with him, but if you can. Um, God, loads of... I don't want to kind of embarrass anyone. Like Aaron, Branadon, um, Saito. Um, like, the, the, you know, you, you leave people out and you think of people. Anybody who was in the chat at that time, pop up, obviously. Um, basically just a human shit post. Um, not you, you, like you, you obviously know what that's like um, with him and half the community does at this point. It's a strange phenomenon. Yeah, would you say he's, uh, you know, kind of the same as he is now? Yeah, pretty much. Um, he's like, if I could say that 2BTT was a scale between communitarians and trolls he's on the extreme end of that scale and and always has been um doesn't give much away about himself i suppose he's close to some people um yeah he's just there you know he, he was that that's the thing he was there a lot he was constant in the chat he would have a spammer enabled or he'd just be shit posting but you know almost any time of the day you'd log in he'd practically be there um and that was right up until 2015 um and i suppose just by virtue of his omnipresence, he probably defined a lot of the culture of the chat and the culture of the server just from his input to it. Yeah, I don't want to get too uh, too pop up larpish because no, that's kind of like, that's kind of cringe. But uh, this, is, this, is gonna, this is this is going to be the uh, yeah, this is going to be the closest I'm going to get to having Kinsey on the show. So yeah, no, I, like I get it. Um, it's become like a weird mythology of its own, but like that's, that's really been the amazing thing since 2017. I've joined these like group bases of people who are like treating 2B2T stuff. Like it's lore, like it's mythology, like it's, you know, like the epic tales of Homer or something. And to some extent, it's like a 21st century version. It's got this sort of deep and bloody history. It is, it is very interesting, you know, that there's so much of this stuff can take place on the internet. So much of this, like, in-game history and i mean you can laugh at people laugh at that all they want you know it's kind of like a, oh you're looking at 2v2t like it's a, uh, you know like you, you're taking it too seriously in a way but you know everyone has their own own kind of view on that you know and yeah, i think I, mean, I think there's definitely an aspect of it that's interesting in that right one thing i suppose you'd observe over years of it is people growing up on it like literally becoming adults exactly from young teens like jared when he first joined i'm pretty sure he was about 13 or 12 he was not an old guy he was you know he wanted a lot of attention and he shit posted he got it to know people a lot and he, you know, he just seemed like a kid and now he's he's like grown on the server into this you, you interviewed him his interview was great yeah um, yeah he um that was my first interview i probably need to re-interview him because it was kind of cringe but um i he joined a year before me he's a year older than i am so we both kind of grew up in this uh, in, in the two B two C environment, and I guess yeah. that's I guess that's why it's like such a you know an important you know such a relevant you know figure in in my life in general, the things that I do. Yeah, but I mean it's it's uh, it's really bizarre. I mean, okay, I have a nine year old cousin who said to me, you know, do you know two B two T? <laughs> oh god I mean, he wasn't even he wasn't even born when the show yeah. started and like this is part of his childhood lexicon like the simpsons or something was to us it's just there it's 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 playground lore you know yeah it's Which, it's, it's that, so that, different now it's such a different such a different experience for different different people and you know they, they, it's had an effect obviously on the demographic of the server it's, it's perceptibly younger now um i would have said initially we were all at least late teens, early twenties, most likely a couple of people like police, Mike and Jared would have been younger, but nowadays I'd say the average age has to be low teens, 12, 13 <laughs> kids coming in from YouTube, you know, it's nuts. It's absolutely crazy. I think, I think you'd be pretty good at making videos to be totally honest with you. I think you have the voice for it. I don't know. Um, I think I you really do. <laughs> I'm, I'm being i'm being totally serious i think you do i could totally I'll see talk. it i'll talk to anyone man um but yeah I, I mean i i could do that at some point that's a bit of a curveball god um <laughs> i don't know i just i just was thinking you know you got you really have the voice for it i think you'd be good at that and you know you obviously played minecraft for a really long time and i mean that wouldn't have to be the only only game you could do but i just i think you have a knack for it 
Yeah, but I'm not particularly... Look, my game is not Minecraft, right? I Minecraft for me is a casual thing. It's banging blocks and hitting mobs and bullshitting with people in the chat. I, I, don't, I didn't use a hack on 2BTT until 2015 because I, I was sort of a vanilla guy. And I, sort, I treated it like pissing around on a sandbox, you know? Oh, there yeah. wasn't this need to build epic shit and... Like, I've not, I don't have much interesting to say about the game except that I've played it for a long time and the way it's developed and the way the server has developed has been interesting to witness. Um, I'm not particularly interested in Minecraft in any other context besides 2B2T um, and this community and these people. Um, I host a private server with friends and that's fun-ish, but like this is the reason I would keep coming back. Yeah, um, this, is, this is the focal point of, like, of what Minecraft has been for me. This is what I always I come back to at some point. Everybody always comes back. I think it's probably the truest realization. If this game has a vision driving it, if it is, if there's something pure to be experienced from it, the essence of whatever it is brought us to the game in the first place, 2BTT probably best represents that. And then whatever way it's developed and morphed over the years, to, to be an optimist about it, it's probably proven that cooperation beats cynicism, that communities can create amazing things even in the face of like a nuclear button every player on 2 bct carries a nuclear button like the big red button that he can press if he decides to grief his base and screw his friends over and fuck his stash up and go to spawn and you know do whatever and for the most part even in bases of 10 15 people these places last months years sometimes and then ones that are secret and kept well secret between tight knit groups have lasted, I know at least a couple of bases that are more than five years old have been active the entire time and everybody's just having a good time. Um, and those, I suppose, are the unsung ones. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, but I mean, I want to talk about a couple of people, like individuals, I guess, that I feel exemplify something about the server or whatever it is. Everybody, I think, at this point has come across Sniper, uh, the Indian dude, who makes the drawings, he puts them on the subreddit. He oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> He's been gone for so long. He has his own YouTube channel too, you know, with his, yeah, yeah. With his like, dad. Okay, you know, like I said about the scale between Pop Bob on the troll end and whoever's on the community sort of trusting the heart of gold kind of end. And Sniper, I think, is the furthest extreme that I've ever witnessed of that. You know, he's the, he, he brings people into this Discord and he wants to voice call people. He wants to kind of get to know people. He commiserates, he sympathizes. And then he, you know, he was the orchestrator, I think, of at least seven or eight major bases. He did this thing called Peaceful Islands where he just invite people to this predetermined coordinate location, practically public. And I, I'm pretty sure numerous group bases sprang forth from those groups. There's, you know, Sage Matthias and, and Drachenstein and... God, hundreds of people. I can't even go through a list of people. There's, there's so many of them. And maybe there are other people out there doing those things on little islands elsewhere on the server. But, certain, you know, as an individual who has basically jumped into the community completely wholeheartedly, what's come of it has been incredible. Like some of the bases, some of the builds, and the groups that have coalesced from that have really been amazing. Like um, last year, no, two years ago, two years ago, 2017, um, I founded a vanilla base and it was about 300k away from spawn. We made the determination early on that we were going to build nether shit and we weren't going to hide it and we weren't going to do anything to prevent the community from discovering it. We were just going to play Minecraft with no hacks whatsoever. None of the items we'd gathered on the server before, none of that stuff and just build a base up. And we did. And that base, Avernus it was called, and it was leaked onto the subreddit a couple of months ago, was only destroyed two months ago at this point. It was posted to the subreddit, then wrecked. Um, and, you know, we'd been basing there for three years without using any kind of hack clients, without using any kind of um, duped items, without taking advantage of any of the stuff that happened in that time, just noodling around in a completely vanilla client. Um, and, like, there were other bases, like Ragnarok 1 and 2, with, like, Oxymoron and Grindlord and those guys, and you know, other group bases going on at the same time. But that one stood out to me for 
the fact that everybody implicitly trusted everybody else not to fuck it up by bringing in stacks of, of rocks and diamonds and it reminded me of what an interesting experience the base game can actually be when you're starting from scratch and building up a town and, and landscaping completely in vanilla um i think we tend to get away from that a little bit yeah absolutely um when it comes to when it comes to playing 2v2 t I'm, I'm definitely more interested when it comes to the building aspect over over pvp uh you know forming forming communities with other players i think it's always been really fun definitely the social aspects obviously because i do a show like this but that, yeah, that's definitely um, the big one and like I said, I kept pretty quiet on that front publicly for a long time. I didn't really participate in kind of YouTube stuff or this is the first time I've ever spoken kind of publicly on voice anyway. Um, and then I suppose I can end it like a news segment. A happy dog story. Um, somebody discovered a dog, a tamed wolf that I parked 2011, 2012. I don't know. I, I should check the area over more thoroughly. There's probably a base somewhere. Um, and they posted it to the subreddit and I picked up on it and I reunited with it. And it was the first time I think I'd kind of jumped into the, the new community kind of in the public sense. And it took off on Reddit. It went crazy. It got like 3000 upvotes or something on the 2 b 2 d sub. And like, I was getting messages from people to go and rescue this tamed wolf and, and like, you know, playing on 2 b 2 t for me these days is a very occasional thing because of the queue. I don't do priority. I don't do kind of anything to try and bypass the queue. So it, it means waiting for a restart or sitting through it. I would do it maybe every couple of months these days, but <laughs> I made a point of getting on and traveling out and rescuing this pup. And um, yeah, that was the last time I logged off. I released him from his sitting down and he came with me when I logged off. And, you know, I think it sort of captured something a bit fucking mawkish and hallmark and, you know, soppy and Reddit yeah yeah about, about it but it no, was nice i'm thing. surprised you're even able to get into the server uh through regular queue i you know i've tried getting in and on restarts and it's like the most difficult task now i haven't played since 2018 because it's so difficult to get in yeah um and i could believe that and a lot of people that that's another thing is like the discords and the communities that people have outside of the server are mostly filled with people who are not playing on the server um they may have played at one time or they may still have a base there, but most of the people who I think would kind of represent the core community probably don't actually play on 2P2T. They play on other servers like Constantium and 9B90 and, and ones like that. And I suppose in a way those servers would be closer to what the previous experience was to the Russia thing and everything, except I guess Constantium, which has a queue now as well. Oh, absolutely. I think I think I think uh, I think Nine is very much on par with what Two B was, in my opinion. Uh, from back from back when I played in twenty fourteen, it's definitely um, at least on that level, you know, of of how the community is and just the feel of the server, in my opinion. Um. Yeah. No. The couple. Of, I I only ever logged on there a handful of times, but I'd agree with that. Um. And then Constantium, I think, has a whitelist now. I was wrong about that Q thing, but yeah, and it's run by uh by Jooms Russells, so. Can't can't trust yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, no, that is God. The people who still have sort of rumors and intrigue associated with the people like James and, and Tristan and, and you know these old sort of grudges still bubbling beneath the surface with people. And uh, yeah, it is it is it is so cringe to look at people like that. Like you know, like oh wow, you know they've done this and this and this. But I think that's part of the interesting thing about it. You know, it's like. You know, these yeah, people like, have, have done this stuff. I mean, you can't take that away. They've done this stuff. So, I mean, they have reason to be, you know, looked at yeah. as, as interesting. Yeah, like there are people who deeply care about their legacy, about what people think of them in the community and how they're perceived. Like, you know, everybody knows Drew Buckman has been pursuing his particular vendettas for at least five years. I'm pretty sure five years or more, maybe, to anyone who listened that, you know, this is what happened and this is who was involved and all of this stuff. And, you know, I, I can't say I've ever particularly cared all that much, but that, that, that was just me. And I suppose I personally think if you get that invested in it, you tend to burn out um, and drop out and kind of, if playing the game becomes a negative thing, you associate negativity with it and you can't let that kind of overcome what you're doing. Yeah. And I think one of the, another one of the big things about 2B is just how, 
you know, it's it's like this never-ending choose-your-own-adventure. You know, it's the ultimate amount of freedom to decide what you want to do, what you, you know, what you want to be interested in, who you want to talk to, who you want to meet. You know, you kind of like, it's it's a game that's kind of built itself because, yeah. I mean, you see in other games, you know, they have characters, you know, they write this stuff out, like they write out stories, but these are like people that are, these are real people, you know, that have formed their own stories, you know, formed their own well, characters. Like, there are... There are emergent gameplay behaviors unique to 2B2T. Every single person who's ever spent any time on the server is aware of the kind of somber experience of traveling another highway for nine hours straight. Uh, it's like a self, yeah, it's like a, it's like a self-made lore, you know? It's like a, a player-created lore. I think that's what's so interesting about it, and that it can be changed at any point and expanded on by anybody. And, and like there's archaeology going on. People are taking screenshots of things they find from years previous or signs that have been in the nether highways that everybody knows. Like random shit is becoming a landmarks for people who are traveling the, you know, spider web of the server. Yeah. And I think, that, I think that's very interesting too, where, you know, it's like you could stumble upon these, these random bases that are made by random people that maybe you've never heard of. You know, it's just... By people that maybe might have just played once and just never came back. Like it's it's just so interesting to me. Yeah, and then like stuff is popping up that hasn't been seen in five plus years, and you would have assumed that someone would have came across it in yeah. the interim. And then you have like people showing up at bases and posting them. And like I said with that dog thing, the fact that somebody just wandered upon it, messaged me on Discord, and and it all kind of snowballed from there. It was just him stumbling upon something from like eight years ago. <laughs> it's just insane when you think about it. So I would like to know what is your what is your opinion on each kind of generation of player you know that you've seen come through you know from 2010 to to present day. You know it's been it's literally been ten years. So. So like I said before, I think the demographic has shifted younger. Um, I think people are coming to the server less out of a general interest. You know, when 2B2T wasn't notorious, we we came because it was vanilla, we came because it was unmoderated. There were many other search servers like that, and 2B2T was the one that stuck around. Um, I would say by 2012, well, the, the face punch thread was a huge influence as well, like loads of people reading it and joining the server off the back of the things that were being posted there. Um, then 2013, um, like I said, there was the first wave of people who I think were really coming in for the no notoriety of the server um, and groups of people joining to play together. Um, possibly there were younger teenagers, I don't know. Um, but you, you know the kind of groups that appeared during those periods. Um, 2015, I think we had like, there, there were like articles and things occasionally, spikes of players, but the lag was so bad that it diminished down to you know, one or two people logging on for a couple of minutes, discovering they couldn't move and then logging off again. And I think FitMC has covered that one. And like at the day, the 2B2T almost died. And the, the, the videos that Fit has done, um, to comment on all of that, I would say if any of us could have done what he has done, we would have. <laughs> if we had known at the time how much interest there could be. And he is the one who who took that on and snatched it. He wasn't the first 2B2 to YouTuber. I, I, you watched Doc Zombie and I saw your interview with him. Um, it was really good and I've always enjoyed his stuff, but Fit seemed to realize the appeal the server had as a dramatic piece, as a as yeah. something that you could hype up like a wrestling match. Like that, that's, that's how he does. That's like his he knew how to, how to cultivate the audience, you know, you know to, make it, to make it seem way more exciting than it actually is. Yeah, and like you can look back on events that you regarded as just being, you know, flinging shit in a sandbox, basically. Toddlers giving each other the finger, <laughs> spamming obscenities into the chat, and all the stuff that happened. And it's, it's, it, again, this lore is built up around it and this whole idea of, of everything. And then, like, that's what gives us this last generation of players. When the, when the Russia war happened and when all that fit MC stuff started up and, and the YouTubers started coming in, I was, I was pessimistic about the effect it would have on the community overall. I thought that it would be detrimental and I thought that they would just be flooding the server forever. But after each major influx, I think that things start to coalesce and the cream starts to rise to the top and then you get the people who are worthwhile. Four to six months later, in each case, you start to see loads of community projects starting up, loads of people doing interesting things around the place, people 
making names for themselves around the face. You know, later dudes like Baba J and 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 God, I like, hate to come up with people's names, Panda and and the the guys who hunt around the spawn and all these different characters who came and went. Um, I would say late 2017, my base from 2015 was greased by a couple of YouTubers. There was Mr. King did that. And at that point I decided to, um, I suppose like leverage whatever sway I had in the wider community to avenge it because I had been basing with swim force. Who's an awesome dude. He's based with so many people and he's one of these people that builds infrastructure in a base like paths and chasms and he he makes a place look aesthetic and he makes a city look like a city he's an excellent builder and you know anybody who knows him he's a great guy um and he had quit the server because of this grief so i decided to basically avenge it and it was interesting to see who would rally to a call against someone for a grief um just on the basis of me asking for it and i had a couple of friends that i'd made at that point in time and they found some stashes belonging to these guys and they blew them up. And like, that was sort of one event that I decided to, to jump in on. Um, not so much out of spite, but more to see what can you do on the server in, in terms of a community? Like, can you leverage an angry mob against someone? If you have that kind of power, you know, Jared is someone who has that kind of sway. There are a couple, there are maybe a couple of people who could always get a group together for a cause. And then you get these giant spawn projects like the, the spawn mason anvil and the, the mega builds and the, the block of water and whatever else. I wasn't necessarily involved in these, but it takes somebody who has risen through the ranks of the server and who has made a name for themselves who can really get the community together to do something like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think I think you were I think you were dead on about Jared being a rallying point. And I think there's a lot of different people who are also, you know, rallying points that if they get involved in something, people definitely will, uh, you know, take, for example, uh, you know, this whole guardsman thing that's happening right now, you know, they pulled in pop up and instantly people are, are flocking to it, you know? Yeah. And it's, like, it's, you pull in someone notable and it just creates so much, um, interest. Like speaking of Jared, um, he's aware of a major base that I'm, I'm part of and he has wanted to grief it for the last two and a half years. He griefed the previous two bases. I think Ragnarok one and two, or he had something to do with, with each of those. And, you know, I had built there and I still talk to this guy. I still chat to him and, you know, there's almost something accepting in, in the idea that somebody just, you know, straight up what you're getting when you're dealing with someone like Jared or someone like pop up and there's no ambiguity there. If it's in his amusement, that's what he'll do. Um, I admit I tease him a little bit with that base, but uh, that may be leaked at some point in the future. When it, whenever it gets discovered, it's like every base has two lives. It's the live while it gets built. And nowadays there's like this second life of it being archived and, and put into, you know, the museum and the, the, the archive and all these different sub servers to be preserved. And then far more people visit them than ever visited them when they were a base. And you speaking of bases, what were some... I mean, what were some prominent bases that maybe you were a part of, invited to, visited, you know, throughout your time? Rhodes was kind of cool. Rhodes was one that I went to much later. Um, that had been like a base in 2012. And then I think it was Jared and a lot, like Jared had been part of it and brought other people. And there were a lot of old fags out there. And there were a lot of, like, it was, it was, it wasn't huge, but there was a lot of different people building there and different kind of, stuff going on and it was a very active base i thought it was interesting that it was a 2012 site that had been brought back to life sometime i think 2016 i, I don't know that somebody else would be more accurate on the history of that but yeah i built a like a shitty lava covered nether rock egg thing that i sometimes i just build absolute nonsense but yeah people would be aware of that um i kind of fire team built can't imagine why um and th that was one interesting base. Uh, Ragnarok 1 and 2, pretty cool bases. Um, again, both wrecked by Jared. They're both up on, on world downloads. Um, there, there would have been a bunch of others. Uh, you, try, you know, you try and be fair to people. Uh, yeah, like, you go to various places and, and base with people. Avernus, as I said, that was, the, the, the vanilla base was kind of cool. Um, I don't know. Like I'm trying to think of bases that kind of wouldn't have been as well known or wouldn't have been as well documented, but like most people know more than I do, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I have a, I have two more questions to kind of wrap wrap this interview up, which I kind of which I ask everybody. Uh, where do you expect you know the server to go in the future, and what is your advice to newer players that might be just joining now? Um, so the future, the cat is out of the bag. Um, it will never be a small server again. It will never be, you know, the hype has reached such a critical mass that seemingly every kid in the playground knows about it. And people, if these kids play Minecraft, they probably drop into 2B2T at least once. You have to look at the bigger picture of the game itself. Um, Microsoft is pushing the bedrock version everywhere that they can. The Java version remains as a kind of afterthought. Um, they'll probably keep it around, but I'd say most players will start to drift towards bedrock over time. Um, 2B2T will always have its place in in the stable of, of servers that people visit. I think it will always be there. Um, I think it will look, probably stabilize more or less as it is now, though maybe interest in the YouTube stuff might wane over time. Um, I think as kids kind of drift to other games and things. Minecraft seems to have stuck around, so I could be wrong. Um, you know, it's become like a a staple like Lego or something. I don't know. Um, what the future holds for the server is kind of dictated by what the future holds for the game, um, I think. Because at this point, what it has become is kind of what it remains. Yeah, yeah. And um, and what do you think, you know, what, what would people want to uh, to utilize? You know, so oh, what would... I, yeah, advice. Yeah. What would I say to someone joining the server? Um, don't value yourself <laughs> in the beginning. Go and talk to people, follow people around, run around, spawn naked, die a bunch. It doesn't matter. Just keep respawning over and over and over again. Chase people, punch people, trust people, go base with people, get blown up, lose your items, go die, go die. Yeah, that's it. I'll end on that. Go, go die. <laughs> Love, lovely, <laughs> lovely way to end. Lovely way to end. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for being on. This was a, this was an amazing interview. Yeah. I hope you get something usable out of this. Um, I, as far as I'm concerned, I've talked shit for an hour, but good luck. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Take care, man. Bye-bye.